Um, welcome to the Tree of Life, Interconnecting Religions, Artistic Traditions, and Scientific Knowledge. This is a two-day conference at the University of Connecticut aimed at promoting interdisciplinary and interfaith dialogue on the theme of the Tree of Life. The conference is part of a larger project called the Abrahamic Story of the Tree, supported by the University of Connecticut's Abrahamic Program, which fosters intercultural engagement, especially around issues of historical and contemporary importance to the Abrahamic religions, uh, that is Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. This conference brings together speakers with a wide range of expertise in Judaic studies, Mediterranean studies, medieval European art history, Islamic art history, Indonesian culture, um, landscape architecture, early modern art history, and evolutionary biology. While some of our speakers are here at the University of Connecticut, others are joining us virtually from Israel, Turkey, and Indonesia. The format of the conference is designed to promote discussion. Each talk will be about 40 to 45 minutes, leaving around 15 minutes for questions and answers. We encourage questions from those who are here in the conference room and those who are joining us virtually. Uh, we ask that if you are in the Zoom webinar and if you wish to pose a question, to use the chat function during the talk and we will collect the questions and read them out after each talk. Um, I would especially like to thank uh, Matthew Larson, Kinga Karlaska, and Alexis Boylan for their help in coordinating this event. Uh, funding for the conference was generously provided by the University of Connecticut Office of Global Affairs and the Yukon Humanities Institute. And I would also, of course, like to thank all of our speakers who are taking other time to share their expertise with us. And so I will go ahead and introduce our first speaker, uh, Yehesko Landau. Um, Dr. Yehesko Landau, a dual Israeli-American citizen, is an interfaith educator, trainer, consultant, and author, active in Jewish-Christian-Muslim relations and Israeli-Palestinian peace building for over 40 years. While in Israel, he was executive director of the Oz V'Shalom Netavot Shalom religious peace movement during the 1980s, then co-founder and co-director of the Open House Jewish Arab Peace Center in Ramla during the 1990s. From 2002 to 2016, he was a professor of Jewish tradition and interfaith relations at Hartford Seminary in Connecticut and holder of the Abrahamic Partnerships Chair. He is the author of numerous articles and essays, as well as the research report, Healing the Holy Land, Interreligious Peace Building in Israel, Palestine, published by the U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, today, he will be speaking on the majesty and indispensability of trees where science and spirituality converge. There we go. Welcome. Have a seat. Shalom to you and to everyone. Thanks very much for including me in this exciting conversation. I'm very grateful to the conference organizers, especially Professor Catherine Moore and Kinga, and to the Yukon Office of Global Affairs, Dan Wiener and colleagues for sponsoring our gathering. I look forward to the wide range of presentations and the discussions they will spark. I hope my own remarks evoke some thoughtful and feelingful reactions that can be shared so that we can learn from one another. Trees have always fascinated me and brought me great pleasure. I've had special relationships with particular trees throughout my life. During my childhood, I cherished the weeping willow in our backyard. I love to climb it and nestle in its branches. I painted it for a seventh grade art class and I mourned its loss when hurricane force winds uprooted it a few years later. I enjoy walking contemplatively through a forest, basking in the dappled light streaming through the leaves and in the symphony of sounds created by the wind and the multitude of creatures who call the forest home. At the moment, my wife Joyce sitting over here and I live in a townhouse in Bethel, Connecticut, next to Danbury, 
with both conifers and deciduous trees on the hill outside our kitchen window. We enjoy sitting on our deck at sunset, taking in the majestic view of trees ascending that hill to touch the western sky. My remarks today have a dual focus, trees as living beings and trees as cultural icons. In both dimensions, we have much to learn from trees. They can be powerfully transformative teachers if we are open to their wisdom. Matthew, sorry, I just want to ask that little box where of me speaking, can that be moved anywhere so people can even there? That's thank you. Since we're meeting just a few days after Earth Day, I want to acknowledge first that trees are indispensable participants, our essential partners in the web of creation, the sacred ecology in which we are all embedded. Modern science has taught us how our own welfare and survival are interwoven with that of trees. Forests are the lungs of our entire ecosystem. The gaseous exchange trees constantly generate with the absorption of carbon dioxide and the release of oxygen is essential for all life on this planet. So in this post enlightenment age, we have a rational reason to view trees along with all of nature with reverence. According to forest ecologist, this is not working, what? There we go. According to forest ecologist Suzanne Simard, trees are really not individuals in the sense that Darwin thought, competing for survival of the fittest. In fact, they are interacting with each other, trying to help each other survive. As we humans come to grips with the ecological catastrophe unfolding before our eyes, we need to heed the lesson in mutual care and concern that trees live out. Like us, trees are interdependent social beings communicating with each other through underground fungal networks. They may also communicate in other ways. An article published in the scientific journal Cell earlier this month reported that at least some plants when undergoing stress or distress, such as physical damage or dehydration, emit high pitched sounds that are undetectable to humans but are potentially perceptible to other plants and to animals. Trees are mutually supportive with the stronger, more mature ones sharing nutrients with the weaker, more vulnerable trees around them. And the forest thrives best when it is comprised of a variety of tree species, since diversity serves collective survival and enrichment. Through their living example, trees demonstrate how cooperation across lines of difference rather than ego-driven competition benefits every member of the community. These are fundamental biological truths. As an endangered species ourselves and a threat to all other living creatures, we need to enshrine those truths as the cornerstone for the global society we will bequeath to future generations. Supplementing this scientific foundation, I want to explore the impact of trees on human consciousness and culture as reflected in the religious and artistic imagery found in all wisdom tradition. As natural wonders, trees have always captivated the human mind and imagination. Their roots extend deep into Mother Earth while their branches extend upward toward the sky. They are the perfect symbol of the interconnection between earth and heaven, the natural world and the supernatural. The magic and majesty of trees are foundational elements of the human story. In some belief systems, trees are considered spirits, even deities, often in feminine form. Through all forms of art, Humans have celebrated trees since the dawn of history. 
language and literature, use arboreal metaphors to refer to key aspects of our lives, our historical roots and family trees, branches of knowledge and government, the fruits of our labors, and many more. Trees are among the oldest living beings on earth. They can live for hundreds, even thousands of years, and they exhibit programmed responses to, to the perpetual rhythm of the season. Clearly, their experience of time and longevity is radically different from our own. As my dear friend Melina Rudman, a gardener and spiritual director, has written in her lovely book called Sacred Soil, sorry about that band on the top, trees are matter made into memory. Their rings carry the history of their lives in narrow and wide bands of growth. Feast and famine map into their interior lives. Records we are not privy to until the tree falls or is felled. They live lives on a different scale than our own. The universal symbol of the tree of life, linking the life force animating our planet to its specific manifestation through trees is the designated theme for our conference. As we explore this motif through art, science, and religion, this is Gustav Klimt's painting called The Tree of Life. It's helpful to recognize that these realms of human cre creativity, art, science, and religion are distinct but interrelated expressions of the human spirit. All three areas of wisdom are represented in university curricula, and the boundaries separating them are permeable and often completely blurred. This wide, wide angle perspective is reflected in the subtitle for my presentation, Where Science and Spirituality Converge. Our conference, as Catherine noted, is part of a framework within UConn's Office of Global Affairs that explores the relationships among the different Abrahamic faith traditions and their adherents in the Middle East, North Africa, and here in North America. As an interreligious educator, I can share <clears throat> some helpful references to sacred trees in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Judaism, my own tradition, offers a variety of teachings about trees and their significance, both physically and metaphysically. Deuteronomy 2019 asserts that the human being is like a tree of the field, ki ha'adam etz ha'sadeh, suggesting that we share essential qualities with our botanical neighbors. In the account of creation in Genesis, which is the which is foundational for both Judaism and Christianity, two archetypal trees in the primordial garden of Eden are described. A tree of life, Eitz HaChayim, and a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Eitz Hadat Tovara. According to Genesis 2, humans were permitted to eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, including the tree of life, except for one the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When the first man and woman violated that prohibition, they were expelled from the garden and denied access to immortality through the tree of life. Proverbs chapter three, verses 17, 18, uses the tree of life metaphor to describe the Torah, the wellspring of divine teaching. Its ways are ways of pleasantness and all its paths are peace. Is it a tree of life to all who hold, hold fast to it? And that's what you see on the ark cover there. And all who safeguard it are happy. And in Proverbs 11, verses 28 and 30, we read, the righteous shall flourish like foliage. The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. In Kabbalah, the Jewish mystical tradition, tree of life symbolism is used to designate 10 divine emanations or sfirot, that infuse all of creation. Professor Yossi Chayes, who's scheduled to speak after me, and I'm looking forward to hearing his presentation, will elaborate on this mystical symbolism. In Christianity, the cross on which Jesus was crucified is sometimes described as a tree of life. 
with its vertical and horizontal axes resembling a tree trunk and branches. First Peter, verse 24 reads, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Like a tree, the cross connects heaven and earth as it represents reconciliation between God and humanity. For Christians, the cross is the material instrument for effecting human atonement and salvation. And as such, it is also a portal to immortality. In a popular Christian hymn, Sing My Tongue, The Glorious Battle, the fourth stanza reads, Faithful cross, true sign of triumph, be for all the noblest tree. None in foliage, none in blossom, none in fruit, your equal be. Symbol of the world's redemption for the weight that hung on thee. And at the end of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, at the beginning of chapter 22, offers a mystical vision of the new Jerusalem descending from heaven. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. In Islam, there are many references to trees, with two particular trees highlighted. The first is the tree of immortality, Shajarat al Hulud, the only tree associated with the primordial garden. And the second is Tuba, or blessedness, a tree growing in paradise, a realm also referred to as a garden, Jana. The parallels to Christian tradition are evident. Jews, Christians, and Muslims share common origins in the Middle East, where the olive tree is especially important, valued both for its fruit and its oil. It's a vital element in the economies of the region with entire families taking part in the annual olive harvest. The olive branch represents peace, shalom, et salam, an elusive and yearned for blessing in a region weary of armed conflict. Olive oil is associated with light, purification, and anointment. It's a tangible symbol of consecration. The Quran in Surah An-Nur, the chapter of light, chapter 24, ayah, verse 35, contains this sublime passage. And here's a calligraphic rendition of it. Allah is the light of heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth. The parable of his light is as if there were a niche containing a lamp. The lamp enclosed in glass. The glass shining like a brilliant star, lit from a blessed tree, an olive tree that is neither of the east nor of the west, whose oil is well nigh luminous, even though fire had not touched it. Light upon light, Allah guides us unto his light, the person who wills, guides unto his light, the person who wills to be guided. And to this end, Allah propounds parables to human beings, since Allah alone has full knowledge of all things. Of course, parables and sacred stories are not restricted to the Abrahamic or monotheistic tradition. Metaphorical tales and symbols are used in all cultures and time periods to convey philosophical, psychological, and ethical teachings. The symbol of a world tree or a cosmic tree or a tree of life representing the divine energy that permeates the universe and connects everything that exists is both ancient and contemporary. For the Celts centuries ago, such a tree symbolized harmony and balance. When they cleared land for farming or habitation, they would leave one tree standing at the center of the cleared area. Important gatherings were held under that tree and it was forbidden to cut it down. And on this continent, the indigenous people's sense of reverence for the whole sacred ecology is reflected in this testimony by Oglala Lakota leader, Black Elk. I was standing on the highest mountain of them all and round about beneath me was the whole hoop of the world. 
And while I stood there, I saw more than I can tell and I understood more than I saw. For I was seeing in a sacred manner the shapes of all things in the spirit and the shape of all shapes as they must live together like one being. And I saw that the sacred hoop of my people was one of many hoops that made one circle wide as daylight and as starlight. And in the center grew one mighty flowering tree to shelter all the children of one mother and one father. And I saw it was holy, but anywhere is the center of the world. To illustrate how the sacred dimension of trees can inform spiritual practice, I'd like to share a Jewish ritual that I find particularly meaningful. Its origins lie in the extraordinary group of Kabbalists who lived in the Galilee town of Safed, or in Hebrew Tzvat, in the 16th century. It's associated with the Jewish festival of Tu Bishvat, the new year of the trees celebrated in late January or early February. Now, the middle of winter would seem to be a strange time to mark the start of a new annual cycle for trees, but it is the time when almond trees throughout the Holy Land are blooming, filling the landscape with their resplendent pink or white flowers. I lived in Jerusalem from 1978 to 2002. And each winter I enjoyed walking through an enchanted valley or wadi near my home. I called it Eme Kashkediot, the Valley of the Almond Trees. The emergence of almond blossoms in the natural world is one reason our rabbinic sages chose the depths of winter to mark the new year of the tree. There's another reason, one that has mystical resonance for our interior lives. At the end of January and beginning of February, when it's often chilly and rainy in Israel, Palestine, sap starts to rise from the tree roots, initiating a process that will result in the buds and blossoms of spring. This organic dynamic life force can't be perceived by our senses, but we know it is there. The lesson in this aspect of Tubishvat is that we need to connect with our own existential roots and be nourished by the spiritual sap that flows through our bodies and our consciousness as we grow like trees and other plants toward the light. In our case, the divine light that the Holy Quran describes in the chapter of light, Surah Tanur. As a way of deepening our spiritualities on Tu Bishvat, the Jewish mystics in Safed created a special messianic meal, a Seder, for this tree festival. Like the Passover Seder, two months later, it has four cups of wine or grape juice. But the Tu Bishvat Seder follows a sequence that parallels the flow of the seasons. First, a cup of white wine or juice symbolizing the snow and the barren trees of winter. Then a second cup with white wine and a bit of red wine symbolizing the buds of early spring. Next, a third cup with half white and half red wine or juice symbolizing the blossoms of late spring, aside from the almond trees. And finally, a fourth cup with only red wine or juice symbolizing the lush green leaves of summer. In between these four cups are three courses of fruits and nuts from trees that are native to the Holy Land. The first course consists of nuts and fruits that have an outer rind or shell, which has to be removed in order to eat what's inside, including almonds, other nuts, and fruits like oranges and pomegranates. After the second cup of wine or grape juice, the second course comprises fruits that are soft and edible on the outside, but have inedible pits at their center. In particular, because it's the Holy Land, dates and olives. And following the third cup, the third and last course is made up of fruits that can be eaten in toto with nothing to remove or discard. And in the Holy Land, these are primarily grapes and figs. These last two fruits evoke spiritual, scriptural associations. 
in two prophetic passages within the Hebrew Bible, Micah chapter 4, verse 4, and Zechariah chapter 3, verse 10, we are told that at some future time, everyone will sit under their vines and their fig trees, and no one will terrify or terrorize them. This prophetic vision of messianic peace and security connects to the overall message of the Tubishvat Seder. We are invited through this ritual to transcend our fears through deepening our faith, mustering the courage to overcome the impediments we face. For the sequence of courses in this Seder reflects three stages of human growth in the face of fear, and who among us is totally fearless? In the first phase, or course of foods, as we bundle up to stay warm in winter, we protect ourselves from the emotional harm with the character armor that resembles an outer shell or rind. We know lots of people like that, right? But after drinking a second cup of hope and promise, we can lower our guard enough to relate to others with congeniality discarding our defensive outer shield, but retaining a hard, self-protective heart like a pit, determined not to let anyone get close enough to break our hearts through pain and grief. And finally, when we are, we've bolstered our faith sufficiently to reach a state of almost, let's say, total fearlessness, we can take even greater risk and become more vulnerable, trusting that if we are totally consumed like a grape or a fig, God will remain our protector no matter what happens. Such firm and grounded faith, trust in the one who sustains the universe through love is what we experience when we fall in love and surrender to that life-giving power. <clears throat> the exhilaration of a new beginning that will fundamentally transform our lives <clears throat> is captured in the poetic prose of the Lebanese American writer Khalil Gibran, author of the modern classic, The Prophet. The first kiss is the beginning of the song of life. It is a word uttered by four lips proclaiming the heart as a throne and love as a king. It is the first flower at the tip of the branch of the tree of life. I can see that image for a long time. Although not as transformative as a new love affair, I find the Tubishvat Seder to be a powerful spiritual practice when shared with others. An interpersonal act of faithfulness, an aesthetically and gastronomically rich way to affirm our confidence in providential care, protection, and empowerment. Faith in Hebrew is emunah, related to imun, the word for trust. This is a core spiritual orientation that precedes and undergirds any particular theology, creed, or religious worldview. It is the quality of character that allows us to weather life's storms, the way a tree with strong roots can bend and survive in the midst of a hurricane. As we move forward through a time of great anxiety caused by the lingering impact of a global pandemic, an intensifying ecological crisis, and by violent conflicts around the world, we can find reassurance and hope in the roots of our faith, the sturdy trunk of our families and communities, and our outstretched hearts and arms, which are the branches through which we connect with others. All in order to share the fruits of our common labor toward a more just, peaceful, healthy, and secure world for all. I'd like to share a poem written by Claire Dubois, who's active in a network called Tree Sisters. Dubois is most fitting as her surname, since in French it connotes a woodworker or someone who lives in the woods. <laughs> Here are the words for you on the PowerPoint slide. Where trees breathe, new life is born. Where each branch reaches out to me, I know myself held in the arms of purest generosity. Where the leaves fall, I am blessed with a giving back that nourishes the roots of my soul. 
for the trees reflect who and how I can be. Standing tall, true, honest, and undeniably me, unafraid to love, to give, to share, and to bend. So I bless the forest and I, as I learn from them. If we can learn from the trees and the forests around us, blessing them and being blessed in return, and if we can together forge a practical wisdom that integrates the natural sciences, the social sciences, the arts, and holistic non-sectarian spirituality, we humans have a chance to survive and flourish as an interdependent global community. Everything I've shared with you is rooted in a twofold sensibility. First, a sense of foreboding engendered by the climate crisis that grows more ominous by the day. And second, a sense of responsibility toward the next generations who will experience the consequences of our actions and our inaction more than we will. I think it's fitting that as I near the end of my remarks, I invoke my beautiful granddaughter, Ella, who is two and a half and who lives with her parents, my son, Rafael, and daughter-in-law, Maya, in the Israeli city of Gibatayim, next to Tel Aviv. Last month, Ella's kindergarten celebrated the Jewish holiday of Purim based on the biblical book of Esther. In keeping with the tradition of donning costumes to assume another identity for that day, the toddlers were asked to dress up in some outfit related to the theme of the forest. Here's a photo of little Ella dressed as a pine cone, or in Hebrew, it's trubal. Pine trees and pine cones have for millennia been symbols of hope, regeneration, and eternal life because as conifers, they retain their green needles through the winter. To the Iroquois tribes, the white pine was a symbol of the great peace that united their separate nations into one league. I'll conclude with some inspiring words from the website, treespiritwisdom.com. Check it out. Created by the German born author, Laurel Waters. By her own account, she has felt a spiritual affinity with trees since she was a little girl. On her website, she wrote, all pine trees produce pine cones. The Latin word for pine cone is pinea. In the 1680s, the French word pineal literally meant like a pine cone. As the science of physiology grew, correlations were made between trees and human anatomy. Look at that image. The pineal gland was given its name because of its resemblance to a pine nut. The pineal gland is a light sensitive organ that produces the hormone melatonin that helps to regulate our wake sleep patterns. This intrinsic connection between pine trees and our need to track the cycles of the sun from light to dark is a responsibility we all share. And Ms. Waters continued, the pine spirit is reminding us to take responsibility for our actions and to connect with our intuitive cycles and higher purpose. By embracing our sense of purpose, we are better able to stabilize what may feel shaky or uncertain. Pine also inspires us to tap into our inner light as we move through periods of darkness. So together with Laurel Waters and with my granddaughter Ella and children everywhere in my heart and mind, I invite us all to reconnect with our spiritual roots, to care for one another as trees do, and to unite in the service of ecological sustainability and the flourishing of all life on this beautiful, fragile planet. May that be God's will and our own. Thanks, and I gladly welcome any reactions, questions, comments you may have.
shouldn't have to talk a lot about that. Change the relationship with God. Another layer of how they are Christian is in giving them a silent God's grace and mercy. Let's just take some time. I had to go back and I had to we go back to the sensibility to make the society more sensible. We don't learn. Question of the you know, I, in my own technocratic mind, it's going to probably capture the strategy. But that's a question. Okay, with pleasure. First of all, I think we need to direct our kavana, our intentionality, as well as our tax dollars and material resources and corporate funds towards scientific, technological answers to the carbon emission crisis and the, the pollution caused by fossil fuel. So I was just, so that we need scientific answers to what we have created through our misuse or abuse of technology. Um, just the other day, somebody on television said there's enough wind power on this planet to power everything we need four times over. We can just harness, but that takes a, a leap of consciousness, a kind of paradigm shift, um, which I wouldn't say capitalism is necessarily counter to. But we, since you said going back, we have to empower and and celebrate the stories of indigenous people who have their own wisdom being integrated more holistically, organically into the uh, wider ecology. And it's at least symbolically important that Deb Holland, a Native American, is now Secretary of the Interior. That's pretty remarkable given the American history and its treatment of the indigenous peoples on this continent. So that there has to be some combination of scientific wisdom and spiritual wisdom that will help us overcome our narrow-mindedness and our selfishness and greed. That's my short answer. Well, I think uh, I Maybe you can match them up with a tree as a spiritual buddy for, for you and watch them grow, care for them. Yes. Well, for my own tradition, Sabbath observance is right. is at least a weekly reminder that uh, we need to recharge our spiritual batteries in order to discharge our social obligation to the other six days. Or in Zen, pulling the bow back, Zen of archery. Yeah, we, we are always driven to move ahead. You know, we have this linear understanding of time rather than the cyclical notion of time, which the trees teach us, yeah, especially the seasons in New England. And
Any anybody online want to join the conversation? Okay. All right. We'll be back at two, but uh, I'd like to keep going. Thank you. All right. I'm, I'm so glad that a university is taking this seriously enough to have a conference like this. This is our, 